I pray that you know the joy of forgiveness in your life. And I pray that as we come together today and as we study the things of God and study about his great forgiveness, study about and learn about his Holy Spirit that he gives us and envelops us and covers the life of the believer, that you'll go out and be able to offer the same to others. See, that's why we're here today. We're here today to be encouraged in the things of God so that we can go out and then make that manifest to the world. You see, we are the hands and feet of Christ. We are the ones that are the mystery of God into the world. We are the church, and God has bestowed upon us a great responsibility. So I pray that today that everything you learn, everything that you feel, everything that you gain or, or is fostered to you today, that you go out and share it with someone because that's our job. We are the church, and we are to reveal the mysteries of God to the world. Amen? If you have your Bibles, take them and hold them up for the world to see. We're going to make a decoration for all of our visitors. This is what we believe about this word, this logos of God. We believe that all Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work. So today is for the equipping of the saints. Every son and daughter of God, we're here today to give you the ammunition, if you would, to give you what is needed to go out and share his goodness and his great name, the worth of his glory with the world. Last week, if you were here, we began a sermon series called The Mind of Christ and how we must go out and must foster and must learn about and must garnish for ourselves the very mind of Christ. The word here used in, uh, for the mind is phroneo, which is a Greek word that means to think or to regard or hold an opinion or to set one's mind or to have an attitude. Everyone say attitude. So we want the same attitude that Christ has, and I pray that we're doing that. We see in America that there is a battle, if you would, for the minds of every, every man, woman, child, and the, the battle is raging for the minds, for the attitudes, for the opinions, for the, the mindset, for the, what they regard to be important. In America, we see the divide between the, the, the holy, between the devoted, between the, the pure and the chaste and the temperate. And then we see things that are not of God and actually the word of God calls that are enemies of the cross. Some shameful things being lifted up, being made famous and important. The right things, the just things, the, the loving things are called wrong and are canceled. And we're not able to even speak of them in certain situations. But who knows that God's ways will always prevail. Don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid. Don't get caught up in the, the moment or the fear of the day. God will have his way. And he will do it through his people. In Romans chapter 8, verses uh, 5 through 8, and these are verses that we will hold on to each week while we're doing this short sermon series. It says in, in chapter 8 of Romans, uh, verses 5 through 8, if you're there, say, oh yeah, for those who are according to the flesh, they set their minds on the things of the flesh. Their attitude, their regard, their opinions are set on the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And I know with all of my heart, you would have not have gotten up today and ventured out on a beautiful morning to come and sit in a place. And all we talk about are the things of God. You wouldn't subject yourself to that unless you wanted to please God. Your faith pleases God. It's truly the only thing that does please God, according to, to uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Faith is the thing that pleases God. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. With faith, how, faith, however, you can have victory with God. Do you believe that? And if you want victory with God and if you want to please Him, then we can have the mind of Christ and not the mind of the world. The attitude of the world are on shameful things. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 18 and 19, for example, it says, For many walk, Paul's writing to the church at Philippi, and he says, For many walk, of whom I have often told you, and now tell you, even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Some would say antichrist. Don't get so caught up on that. Anything that's against Christ is antichrist, okay? Anything against Christ. The mindset of America, the mindset of culture, the mindset on self is against, it's anti-Christ. Look at verse 19. It sort of gives a descriptive uh, uh, understanding. The mindset on the world, the mindset on flesh, 
Their end is destruction. Their God is their appetite and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on empty things. And we know the definition of glory is, is their weight, their importance, their fame is found in shame. And we see it happening every day, don't we? We have to guard ourselves and guard our children from shameful things, from the things that should be shameful. They're lifted up as saying things that are beneficial. Something is wrong. And I believe with all my heart it's a battle for the mind. Things of submission and obedience and purity and unity and selflessness. Those things are, are, are stomped down and pushed down by the world. I just don't understand it. But it's the things of God that we need to do. But we also know that our mandate, right? What are we to do as followers, as sons and daughters of the Most High King? What are we to do? We know it says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, whatever you do, whatever you do, do it, do in the, do in the word, I'm sorry, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, gave in thanks to him through God the Father. That's our job. That's what we are commanded to do. We are to be in this chaos, to be a part of this world that is falling and waxing worse and worse. And we're to give God glory. We're to do things according to his will and his purpose. And the struggle is real. Turn to your neighbor and say, the struggle is real. It's hard to have the mind of Christ when you're surrounded with the things of the world. And in America, it's the worst place that we can do to foster this. Because there is so much self in America, right? There's so much self, there's so much ability to focus on yourself because we're so wealthy. Listen, guys, all we have in America is first world problems. There are no third world problems. You're not dealing with a third world problem. Sometimes it's staff meetings and, and when we're here on campus, I'm like, man, that's really a, not a third world problem right now. You know, that's a first world dilemma, but it's not a third world problem. And so what we have to realize is where we're coming from and the, the paradigm in which we're living We are to give God glory. We're to bring him praise in this difficult situation. And the way we do that is to have the mind of Christ. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, this is actually the verse that that, uh, describes our, our youth program here. It says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your what? Your mind, your attitude, what you regard as important. Those things the renewing of your mind, your attitude, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So we're here today to help transform our minds, to take our minds off the flesh and put them on godly things. That's why we're here. Turn over to Philippians chapter 2, and this is sort of our basis, if you would. Chapter 2 of Philippians, uh, verses 1 through 11, is is sort of our, our foundation for this sermon series. And it's talking about the mind of Christ. In in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, it says, Have this attitude, or the mind, have this mindset, if you would, in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, last week when we were together, we talked about how these verses, Philippians chapter 2, were both prescriptive, this is what you should do, but then they're also descriptive, and it gives us an example of how to accomplish that. So chapter 5 is sort of the fulcrum. It's sort of the tipping point. Chapter 5 is saying, have this attitude which was in Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter 2 tells us to have the attitude of Christ, and then it explains how Christ had that attitude. All of you that know me, all of you that know New Covenant Fellowship, we're here to help you not to, to be informed about what God did and how he accomplished it. We don't want you to be ignorant or uninformed about the things of God. We want you to have victory in your life as a follower of Jesus Christ. And so we want to not only prescribe it, you should do this, you should do that. We want to tell you how. Someone turn to your neighbor and say, that's important. How do I do that? Man, when my workplace is everything set on self, every person in there, and I'm supposed to bring God glory in the middle of that, how do I do that? By adopting the mind of Christ. By being transformed, not conformed. You know, that word, that word conformed means to be squeezed upon it and molded. And that's what the world's trying to do to you. And parents, that's what they're trying to do to your, to your children. They're trying to mold your children into be some kind of social justice warriors. Man, we're raising champions for Christ in this place, not for justice. He is the just one. Amen. We've got to get serious about this battle, everyone. We can't sit back with our arms folded just, I want to see how things work out. No, today is the day to fight. Today is the day to represent Christ. Today is the day not to be conformed to the things of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
I pray that a mighty transformation happens in this place. So we talked about the mind of Christ. Well, what is the attitude of Christ? What does God regard? What, is the, what, is, what does Christ regard? And in Philippians chapter 2, there's three things. Three things that, that sort of envelop the mind of Christ. Unity, humility, and to be selfless. Those three things encompass the mind of Christ as it was described to us in Philippians chapter 2. This is not only the prescription, but it's also being described of how to become this. So Christ came to bring God glory. And for us to do that, we must pursue these three things. Let me remind you of one thing before we pray and go into today's message. Three minus one is incomplete. You hear me today? You know, so it's so easy in the church to say, well, I got that right, even though I failed over here. No, everybody, we should always strive for excellence. Turn to your neighbor and say, strive for excellence. We should always try to be complete in the things of God. We, if we're str- striving for unity and yet we, we lack selflessness, we need to strive for selflessness. And are, you, are you tracking with me today? Because we don't want to be found lacking. On Christ's return, it says in 1 John in 1 John chapter 2, verse 28, upon his return, we don't want to be found lacking, do you? Because if we're found lacking, then we're going to shrink back at his return and won't be able to run into his arms. I want every person within the, the, the hearing of my voice today to be able to run into the arms of Christ when he returns. Because isn't that what we're waiting for, everyone? Isn't that the glorious hope that we have? To run into his arms. Let's pray. Father, we don't want to be found lacking. Do your holy work in our lives today, Lord, through your Holy Spirit. Throw out all the things that are in our life, God, that are no good to your kingdom and does not bring you glory. And Lord, fill us to your fullness so that we can be change agents in the world, seeking unity, being humble, and doing selfless acts. We ask that, God, because we need your help for this. And we ask that in Jesus' name. And the church says, amen, amen. Last week, we talked about unity. Everyone say unity. Look at Philippians chapter 2 verses 1 and 2 just real quickly. It says, therefore, if there's any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete, be of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit and intent on one purpose. This is the definition, if you would, verse 2 of unity. Unity being of the same mind, the same love, the same spirit. We talked about that this wasn't necessarily describing the Holy Spirit, that this spirit was being harmonious, having a spirit of harmony between us and being of one purpose. Last week, and I'm just going to, this is the last thing I'm going to say about last week in review. You know, we talked about that first unity starts within oneself. A house divided is surely going to fall. And if your heart is divided between the world and Christ, We encourage you with every ounce of our energy to sell out to Jesus Christ today, to be fully his. Leave the things of the world behind. But when you get that relationship right with yourself, when you're focused on God, then you need to start in the church seeking unity, not uniformity. We've said this over and over. Unity and uniformity are not the same. We don't want a a church that all looks alike and talks alike and comes from the same demographic. We want a church that's a melting pot. An island of misfits, if you would, so that we can all come together because, and the world will see us and say, how do they get along so well? And we says, because Christ's love compels us to do things for him. Amen? And, but when that happens, when we get it right with ourselves and when we get it right in the church, then guess what happens? It spills out, in, out into the streets. It will automatically. And you'll be able to even seek unity that people would you completely disagree with. See, you don't have to agree with them to be united with them because God's love is able to overcome the divide. Amen? Even with people that you vehemently disagree with, you can still seek unity. And that is a mature believer. Today we're going to talk about another subject. Look at verse 3 of Philippians chapter 2. Do nothing with selfishness, selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. I promise you, in most churches today, that verse would not go on a t-shirt, right? A lot of places today are preaching, be the best person that you can be, you know? Be, be the best you that you can be. Scripture is very clear. The thing that we need to be rescued from the most is ourselves. There is no good in us. We are all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. Thus, we need a Savior. And we need a Savior who can save us from ourselves and transform us from having a mindset on the flesh to a mindset on the spirit. So today, one of those things that allows us to do that, to become less so that others can become more, is 
Humility. Everyone say humility. That's a question you don't get asked very, very often. How humble are you, right? How would you answer that? I'm the humblest guy you've ever met in your life, right? Is there really any humility in that? So this is a, a, situ- this is a, a conversation that we need to have. What does that mean? It means not to be proud or arrogant. It means to be modest. And let me add a few words to that. Purity, ch- being chaste, temperate. Those aren't words that you hear in the, the 20, 2021 in church very often. But modesty, those things go into humility. It's an outpouring of humility. And I pray that we will learn the mind of Christ and how he was humble and how we can be too. See, humility is the opposite of pride. I've said often that hatred is not the opposite of love. Apathy is the opposite of love, that you just don't care. Hatred shows that you do care. It just may be in a negative way. But humility is the absolute opposite of pride. It's the absence of pride. How do we do that? How do we define it? Look at Romans chapter 12, verse 3. This is one of the ways that we understand pride. And Paul was telling the church at Rome, um, after he says you got to get your mind transformed, the very next verse, he says, for the, for the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think as so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. So if you would, if you, if you give us a little leeway then, you could, you could almost define pride as being full of oneself, you know? Any of you ever said that? You sure are full of yourself. Anybody ever told you that before? Sure they have. Because they mistake confidence and boldness with pride, but being full of oneself. It's a very important thing to understand that pride means to be full of oneself. And you all know people who are full of pride. I love to point at Muhammad Ali because I'm a product of the 70s. And he was probably the most pride-filled men I've ever seen in my life. He would say things and you would say, what? Crazy. It, this, this story, I thought it was just a joke, but I actually looked it up and it's true because there were witnesses of it. Muhammad Ali was on a flight. He was going to fly across America to, to visit someone. It doesn't matter, but there were witnesses that saw this. The, the stewardess come up to, to Muhammad Ali on the plane. And he says, sir, you need to put on your seatbelt. And he looks around and he looks at the flight attendant. And he says, Superman don't need no seatbelt. And he looked around, you know, started laughing. And the stewardess didn't miss a beat. He, she looked back at him and said, sir, Superman don't need no airplane either. <laughs> right? Pride. Being full of oneself. Thinking more of yourself than you really are. What a great story. 1 John 2, 16 describes it very well. For all that is in the world, everything of the world, the mindset on the, 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 the world is the lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the boastful pride of life. That's not from God. In other words, it's not God-pleasing. This is the very thing that happens from the very beginning. Pride was, not, was the very cause of the fall in the garden. Thinking more of yourself than you really are. I can be like God. I can know the things that God knows. It looks good. It's going to feel good and taste good. And Man, I deserve it because I'm a very big deal. God wouldn't want me not to have it. Has anybody ever said that before? Be very careful with those words. God wouldn't want me not to have something. We've got to be careful, church. We've got to make sure we understand that we're the sheep of his pasture. We're not the shepherd here. We're just the sheep. Everybody go, bye. <laughs> we're just followers, guys. We don't have the intellect. We don't have the knowledge. We don't have the power. We don't have the dominion. We don't have the sovereignty to make the decisions that he makes. But we have a good God who reveals those things to us, does he not? And we can follow him faithfully. We can follow him with confidence that he's going to lead us to green pastures, to places that we can rest. So pride was the root root of the the fall. And I'm not saying that that, that pride is is something that, that, that is ever going to be gone because we're always going to struggle with pride when we're in the middle of this mess in the world, especially in America where our mantra, you know, we talked about this often. We talked about it last week. You know, the, the preamble of the Constitution says that we have certain inalienable rights. Among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And when you get into happiness and you let everyone define happiness for their own definition, happiness is whatever makes me what? Happy. And if my happiness causes you not to have life or liberty, big deal. At least I'm happy. 
And so it is a struggle in your schools, in your workplaces. It is a struggle. We shouldn't, we shouldn't discount it. But you, unity and humility is something that will help us. See, just admitting that pride is a problem is not enough. There's a story in, 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 the, in the 1730s and 1740s. There was a great revival in the Northeast in, in, in the United States. And it, and it flowed and it was a real revival. It wasn't someone that just said, hey, we're having a revival and setting up a tent. This is something that transformed. It led to the revolution. It was a life-changing, nation-altering revival that happened. It's called the Great Awakening. And when it happened in the, in, in, in the north, there was a, 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 somebody at the tip of the spear of the Great Awakening was a, a pastor named Jonathan Edwards. He was a fiery preacher. During, a, during part of the revival, he was holding a, a prayer meeting. 800 men, just men, show up at the prayer meeting. 800 men. And they're praying and they're drawing near to God. They're holding fast to God. They're pressing on in the things of God. During the prayer meeting, while 800 men are praying, a woman in the village sends a note to Jonathan Edwards. And the note says, I have a husband. I have a husband. If you could leave that picture up of the raised hands because it's important to this message. I have a husband who is unloving. He's full of pride. And he's abusive. And during this prayer meeting, as Jonathan Edwards read that, the Holy Spirit urged Jonathan Edwards to share that note with all of those 800 men. And as he shared that note with 800 men, he says, that man has got to be in this place. And that the Spirit of God is at work. He will confess and he will change his ways. He'll be transformed from a mind of the flesh to the mind of the Spirit. Jonathan Edwards read that note and shared it. And 300 men raised their hands and confessed the pride in their life. And they repented and they changed the whole Northeast. Bars were closing. The things of the world were, 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 were on the decline where the things of God were raising up. You see, just raising your hand is not enough, everyone, that I deal with pride. Everyone struggles with pride. What we've got to do is do something about it. Turn to your neighbor and say, do something about it. In Psalm 32, verse 5, man, I've been dwelling on Psalm 32 all week. Psalm 32, 5 says, I acknowledge my sin to you, O Lord. And my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. Pride cannot coexist with the Spirit of God. We have to realize that humility of mind is the absence of pride. It's not about us. It's about Him. So the mind of Christ, the mindset on humility, we have the best example. We're not only saying here, you should be humble. We're going to show you the humble king, and his name is Jesus. That's the beauty of Scripture. God didn't stay in heaven and said, you should be this. I I love you. He sent love to earth to show us how much he loved us. He sent Christ to us to show us how we should behave and how to treat others. So everybody back over to Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. Let's read this descriptive now. It's been prescribed to have this attitude. Now, Here's how the attitude looks. Look at verses 6 and 7. Although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be held on to, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. This emptying of oneself is not some kind of new age, sitting with your legs crossed, going, hmm. You know, emptying yourself. This is something that he did. It manifested within a certain understanding. The word, the theological term here is kenosis, the emptying of oneself. What's the definition of pride? Full of oneself. So do you see the struggle here? The more we're full of oneself, the less of who we can have, right? The less of the Lord we can have. Humility, this attitude, less of you so that others can be more. It goes in the face of culture. Jesus taught this, and we're not going to take time to read the Sermon on the Mount, but he began talking about humility. He said, blessed, and that word means more than happy. More than happy are the poor in spirit, those who mourn, the gentle, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Basically, he could have said, blessed are the humble. Blessed are those who are empty of self and full of the things of God. 
Look at Ephesians chapter 3. This is another verse that you should have marked in your Bibles. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 and 19. And Paul was writing to the church at Ephesus. And he says, for this reason, I bow my knees to the Father. In, in the Old Testament, many of you love to quote 2 Chronicles seven fourteen, where it talks about if my people will, 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 will humble themselves. That actually means to bow your knee, to submit. If you will bow your knee and humble ourselves. From from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, then he who is God would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man so that the Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. And listen to this. Here's the kicker. That you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now, who wants to be filled up to all the fullness of God? It starts with emptying yourself of all the pride that we have there, all of the selfishness, all of the self-centered acts, all of the the self-indulgent nature that we have that was just described to me recently. What a beautiful, beautiful acronym for sin, self-indulgent nature. Man, that's me. Is that you today? Whatever indulges my nature, whatever indulges me, whatever satisfies me, that's the farthest away from a vessel that God can fill. In Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, so God knows our struggle. He knows the struggle is real. He knows that we're full of self. He knows that we have pride and, and lust of our eyes and the lust of our flesh. And he did something to it. He sent an example of Jesus Christ. Look what it says in Hebrews 4, 15 and 16. For we do not have a high priest. Someone said Jesus Oh, that was weak. I like that name. Say it again a little louder. There you go. Who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we might receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We have need of being released from pride to empty ourselves of the things of self. Do you see what happened? The reason I use the example of Jonathan Edwards and that time of repentance, where were they at when they repented? In the presence of God. And the more we can stay in the presence of God and the things of God and with the people of God, the more opportunity we have for humility and doing humble things, becoming less so that others can become more. So Christ emptied himself. This is God. And so let's talk about that, this kenosis. The kenosis of Christ is threefold. So we're going to run through this real quick, okay? I want you to get this. This is so important. If it helped Christ, who was perfect in all of his ways, and yet he saw it fit to empty himself, what did he empty himself of so that I can learn to empty myself as well? The first thing that he did was Jesus became less in the kenosis. He emptied himself. When Jesus became a man, he veiled his glory. We talked about glory today. Glory is the the weight, the importance, the fame of his name, the who he is. He emptied himself of himself, even though his self was perfect. Now, when he emptied himself, he became less. J.B. Lightfoot, who's a just a great theologian, he says this of the kenosis. He says, he stripped himself of the insignia of majesty. Now, you military men or anyone who served in the military or even watched a military movie before, it doesn't matter. You know what that means? That a general would take his stars off and trade it for one strike, right? How many times have you ever seen that happen? That someone of great importance would strip away who they were so the world could even tell. They wouldn't put their names on signs or on on anything. They they would just become less so that they could be a part of the others. That's what Jesus did. He became one of us so that he could show us the right way to love God and to love others. But then at the end of his life, he did something that none of us could do. He took upon, upon himself the weight of the sins of the world, and he died on our behalf. Every one of you, every person who's ever drawn breath, he buried our sins in the grave, and he came to life again in a resurrected self. But while he lived among us, he veiled his glory. He stripped his insignia of majesty away. Why did he do that? Look at John 1.18. John 1.18 says, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he, someone say Jesus, has explained him. See, Jesus came... Veiled in flesh 
so that we could look upon God, so that we could see him and witness him and know him. See, man cannot see God, but man must have the ability to know God. And God does not hide himself. Jesus had to veil his glory. We could not look upon him because he is so glorious. We could not look upon his face. We could not look upon him, his worth, his importance, his fame. Here's a few examples. The three of the inner circle of Jesus' disciples, when Jesus went on the Mount of Transfiguration, his glory leaked out that day. It sort of went out of, a, out of his flesh and, and he became glorious and they could not look upon him. He was so glorious in his being. John the Apostle, he saw the, the glory of the Lord while he was on an island in Patmos. Paul, on the road to Damascus, he sees the glory of the Lord and it blinds him. Isaiah sees the glory of the Lord and he says, what? Woe is me. We cannot look upon the glory of God, but we need to know God. And God in his mercy veiled himself in flesh. He stripped away the insignia of his majesty. Here's a beautiful story. I think this is a beautiful story in Exodus in chapter uh, 29. I'm sorry. Chapter 34 that describes how we are to interact. Moses did a beautiful job of humility. And I just want to explain it to you. So, so look at verse, uh, chapter 34 and verse 29. It says, it came about when Moses was coming down from the mountain and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand and he was coming down from the mountain that Moses did not know. He didn't know it. That the skin of his face shone because of his speaking with him. When he was in the presence of God... And by the way, all he did was look at the back of God when God came across. He couldn't look into his face. When God allowed that moment, it made, it made uh, Moses glorious. Everyone would say glorious. And he began to shine with the Shekinah glory, the, 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 the resonating power, the resonating viewable manifestation of the glory of God. His weight, his worth, his importance is so great that it shines for the world to see. One day we'll be able to look upon that because we'll have resurrected eyes. Can you wait for that, anybody? I cannot wait to be in the throne room. And to see those flashes of lightning and to be able to stand there and to re be revealed to us the glory and the majesty of our God. His majesty. Amen. But we have something in human form that we can hold on to. See, we can relate to a baby in a manger. We can relate to a teacher on a hillside. We can relate to someone that doesn't have a place to lay his head. We can even relate to a man suffering on a cross. We can't relate to the God of glory. But one day we will. We'll be able to look upon his majesty and we'll be able to appreciate it. But out of God's mercy, he, he concealed himself and veiled his glory. He allowed Moses to see it. And Moses came down and his face was shining. He didn't realize it. Look at look what it says. Continue on in verse chapter 34, verses 33 through 35. It says, when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. But whoever Moses went in before, but when Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him in the tabernacle, he would take the veil off until he came out. And whenever he came out and spoke to the sons of Israel, what he had been commanded, the sons of Israel would see the face of Moses that the skin of Moses' face shone. So Moses would replace the veil over his face until he went in to speak with him. I love this. See, God transformed his glory onto his son, Moses. And Moses, the first time he went, went with God, he didn't realize that he had the glory of God on him. And he came and he spoke to the sons of Israel. But every time after that, Moses would veil his glory because he wanted the message to be from God and not himself. See, what we, have, what we often do is we focus on the individual, that person's talents, that person's giftings, and that, this and that. What we should be doing is focusing on God and not the messenger. Do you hear me today? And Moses, in his humility, every time he spoke to someone, he had a veil over his face. He said, don't look at me. Look at him. Don't look at me. Look at him. Don't look at me. Look at him. That's what we need to be. We need examples so that we can be more than what we are. And the way we become more than what we are and the way we receive the glory of God is to become less and less and more about him. Are you tracking today? I want you to go from this place with the glory of the Lord all over you. And to act humbly before everyone you see. Empty of self and full of the fullness of God. Look what it says in, in Matthew chapter 6 verses 1 through 4. 
Matthew 6, 1 through 4, beware of practicing your righteousness before men in a, in a way to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your father. Say it does not please God. When we do things just for be recognized, it doesn't please God. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter when we do it to be recognized because we're full of self. And when we're full of self, we can't be full of him. Otherwise, you have no reward from your father who is in heaven. Verse 2, so when you give to the poor, don't sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they may be honored by men. Truly, I say to you, they have a reward. They have their reward in full. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving will be in secret and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Some must say, put it under a veil. It's not about us. It's about him. When Jesus came, he became a man. He veiled his glory. In John chapter 1, verse 14, in John 1, 14, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory. Glory is the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. He dwelt among us. Now, this word, if you, if you read the Greek, this word means that He pitched His tent. He dwelt, or He tabernacled with us. He covered the treasure with a tent. Listen, guys, this is the most merciful thing he's ever done to us. He pitched his tent in a human body to cover his glory. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 11 says that God has set eternity in the heart of every man and woman. So we have a hunger to know God, but we can't look upon him. The mercy that he did was he veiled himself in flesh so that we could see the acts of God without being able to view his full majesty. Everybody tracking? So how do we look upon the glory of God as that verse said? By what he did for us, right? The way he interacted, the way that he treated the poor like they were sons and daughters of the Most High God, the way that he would eat with the sinners and chastise the Pharisees. We saw the glory of God, the important, the weight, the worth of him by his actions. I pray that you see him at work in your life. I pray that his hand is at work in your life. So the first thing of the kenosis is that Jesus veiled his glory in the flesh of a human the second thing that Jesus did that I find mind-blowing is that he limited himself to the human endeavor. Here's the God of all eternity. I was led to write this. The creator of water became thirsty. The maker of the heavens had, had to sleep below them. The creator of the land was now limited to the roads of Galilee. The one who inspired all of the universe now became hungry, was required to learn, was subjected to human authority. He experienced sorrow, happiness, disappointment, pain, fear, and all the emotions that you and I experience. The God of the universe limited himself to the same things that you and I go through. That is humble, everyone. He is the humble king. He humbly submitted himself to the human experience. He was wrongly accused, unjustly condemned, brutally beaten. He felt the shame of the cross, and the very one who gave mankind life would go on to experience death. This is humble. This is the act of humility. When you hear the word Emmanuel, God with us, when you hear that, you should rejoice and sing praises of hallelujah that he would veil his glory so that we could know God. He did that because of his humility. And we are to have his mindset. We are to do the same. He emptied himself so that he could be acquainted with our struggles. And thus we can look upon him. So what are we to do? If you want to be humble, if you want to become less and to veil the glory, the importance. Because you may enter a room and you may have more intelligence. You may have more power. You may have more fame. You may have everything else than other, in, in, anybody else in the room. But what are we to do? Become less so that they can become more, right? I love the story of Abraham and Lot. Lot was just along for the ride. God didn't say, Lot, come follow your uncle, uncle Abram. Abram just said, hey, come on, follow me, nephew. You need some help in your life. Lot was the benefactor. He was not the man of God. The most incredible story of humility that I know in the Old Testament was Abraham and Lot. So Ab Lot's, uh, Lot became wealthy because Abraham allowed it. And Lot's people and Abraham's people began to argue and to have a, a, a wars, if you would, fights among because of the whales. They all wanted to eat, eat and drink from the same place. And Abraham goes to the mountain with Lot. 
I wouldn't have patience to do that. I said, son, get in your place, boy. I'm the one who's followed. I'm the one who's given it all. I'm the one who's waiting on the promises. Not you. But you know what? You know what Abram did? He takes Lot to a very high place and he says, son, you choose the land you want. I'll trust in God to protect me and take care of me. Someone say humility. Becoming less so that others can become more. That's what Christ did for us. He limited himself to the human endeavor so that we could draw near, hold fast, and press on. Everybody say that. Draw near, hold fast, press on. And the last thing, the last thing, not only did he veil his glory, that he limited himself to the human endeavor, but he stripped himself of the godly attributes. It says in in Philippians 2 that he let go. Everybody say let go. He didn't hold on to godness. He let go of it. Now, while he dwelt as Emmanuel here, he was fully God, but also fully man. He chose to veil his glory. He chose to strip strip away the insignia of his majesty. He chose to limit himself to the dusty roads of Galilee. He stripped himself, however, of omniscience, which means all-knowing, omnipresent, which he had always existed in an omnipresent way. He was present everywhere at every moment, and his omnipotence, his all-powerfulness. He constrained and restricted and restrained his power, his presence, and his knowledge. And he did it all for you and me. Someone should say hallelujah in this place. He did that so that we could see and know God. Humility. In humility, Christ voluntarily anchored himself to one place at one time. Think of the story between Jesus and Lazarus. Here's Lazarus, his best friend on earth, and here he is dead in the grave. What did Jesus do? Did he jump in and rip open his shirt and have JC on the front of it and say, I'm Jesus Christ? No, what did he do? He comes in, he says, Father, if it's your will. He had all the power and the strength to do that. But what does he do? He submits himself to the mission of God. When's the last time you've done that? When's the last time I've done that? To submit myself to the mission of Christ. The cross is the greatest example of humility. In Isaiah chapter 50, verses 6 and 7, it says, I gave my back to those who strike me. This was written 700 years. Don't you think Jesus knew what was coming when he left heaven? Don't you think that he knew the pain and the suffering that he was going to have to do? He was omnipotent. He was omnipresent. He was omniscient. He knew all things. And yet, what did he do? He chose. He chose you and me. Sinners. To die for us. (laughs) Isaiah 50, verses 6 and 7. I gave my back to those who strike me and my cheeks to those who pluck out the beard. I did not cover my face from humiliation and spitting, for the Lord helps me. Therefore, I am not disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. He set his face on the cross from the time he was born in a manger to the time that he hung upon that cross. He knew the suffering that he would do, but his humility caused him to go through with it. The the, the submission to, to to the father's mission. Jesus stripped himself and chose to be anchored to the father's mission to save us. He practiced humility so we would know the mind of God for us. We would know the mind of Christ. He practiced it. He described it with the most incredible act of humility ever given to us. He waited on the Lord and he did not turn away. I'm going to ask Joe to come back and we're going to finish right now. So now we have the prescriptive thing. Be humble. Be united. We have the prescriptive and we have the descriptive, descriptive in the person of Jesus Christ. Our humble king. He came humbly. He came with humility. He came in every turn, every point. He was the the most powerful, the most knowing of anyone in the room. And yet what did he do? He became less so that others can become more. He did not point to himself. He pointed to others. (laughs) I've asked myself this question over and over and over this week. Because I am the one. When I see a problem, guys, I just want you to know my mindset is to run into there, into that problem, and do everything that I am equipped to do to fix that problem. But when is the last time I've submitted myself to the mission of God? Maybe that person needs to go through a little suffering. 
Maybe that person needs for me to wait. Am I willing to submit myself to the things of God? How about you? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Are we humbly serving the Lord or are we doing it in our own strength? Are we humbly serving the Lord and emptying ourselves of self? What about when we're serving others? In Ephesians 5, 21, and if you've been at New Covenant for a while, you know this is a verse that, that I hold deeply. I, I believe that this is one of the, the one foundations of, of, of serving one another. It says in Ephesians, it says, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Now, once again, this isn't a cowering in the corner fear of Christ. This is a respect This is knowing scripture, knowing that he left heaven to come to earth and he became less so that we could come more. This fear, this knowledge of what he did for us. And out of that knowledge, we are to do what? Subject ourselves. Someone say submit. It's the same word. To submit ourselves to one another. What? That word means, hupotasso, willing to align ourselves under another. Wow. When's the last time we've done that? For the benefit of someone else. In America, I've always taken that word and and I redefined it. Especially when I talk about marriage. Marriage is an act of submission. Marriage is an act, a manifestation. I think that's why God is the author of it. Of we're willing to align ourselves under the other so for the betterment of the other. In other words, in America, I think it's better to say we're willing to give up our rights for someone else. When's the last time we've done that? Think of the culture that we live in. When's the last time that we've done that? I don't mean roll over and let someone win you over to be an enemy of the cross. That's not what I'm saying at all. But when's the last time because of the mind of Christ we've humbly interacted with someone? When's the last time we've willingly aligned ourselves under the things of God to, to do his mission and not our own? When's the last time we have given ourselves over to someone else? I'm going to ask you to stand now. Will you, the altar is going to be empty and Joe's going to play a song. And Will you empty yourself today? Will you confess and then go out and live a life of repentance of the things that you're so full of yourself over? Because I have things that I'm full of myself over. And the more I fill myself up with self, the less of God I can have. And I want more of him and less of me. I'm going to remind you what it says and we're going to close with these verses. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 and 19 through 19. For this reason, I bow my knees. I humble myself before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant us, according to the riches of his what? Glory. To be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all of the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses all knowledge that you may be filled up to the fullness of God the things of God are hope and joy and love and peace and contentment God wants to fill you up with those things but it takes humility it takes purity it takes modesty it takes temperance to accomplish that Father, we come to you and we don't want to be lacking. (laughs) Lord, we don't want to be lacking in any of these. Lord, we want your fullness. In your fullness is is abundant life. And if we lack anything, God, if anything hinders us, Lord, if we're not seeking unity, if, if we're not acting in humility, and emptying ourselves and stripping ourselves away of, of the insignity of any majesty we may have or the importance we may have. If we're, if we're not doing, as, as, as Philippians 2 says, not looking out for our own interests, but looking out more for the interest of others, Lord, if we're not that, help us to be that. Lord, it's a struggle in our, in our society when we are so wealthy. <laughs> Lord, when we can do so many things for our own. Lord, from out of our abundance, we can write checks and think that that's a sacrifice on behalf of others, Lord. But it's really out of our abundance and out of our overflow. It's not sacrificial at all, God. You know our hearts. You know our struggle, God. Help us to know the humble king and to be humble ourselves. I pray, God, that as this altar is open, I pray that there would be no shame found here. Found here. I pray, Lord, that there would only be acceptance. And I pray, God, that you would transform us. God, from mindset on flesh to mindset on spirit. And I pray, God, that you would do that in Jesus' name.
Amen. Amen. So as we sing, the altar is open if you'd like to come and pray.